Well, hi. Um, this evening is billed as something about flow. Um, flow in the lean sense. Uh, I'm not really going to talk much about the flow in terms of immersion and the state of mind that is flow as represented by Mihaly Csikszenty Mihaly, for example. Um, hmm? Good yeah. Although we, we yeah. <laughs> although we can uh, we can we can segue into that if you if you like. Um, so we're going to be here for about an hour, give or take. Allow some time of the, in that for questions. Uh, do ask questions at any time because this is hopefully more of a conversation than a than a presentation. I don't have any slides today. Um, in fact, I've kind of given up given up using slides entirely. Um, that suits me better. I never know what I'm going to talk about anyway, and I always feel like I'm on tram lines if I have a set of slides that I have to conform to. So I like to um, follow the interests of the audience. So again, uh, if there's anything you particularly want to cover, if there's anything you want to talk to each other about, I'm good with that as well. Um, and as I said, we'll have some time at the end, and then at about 7.30, I understand there is food and wine. So... Uh, that may be worth staying for, and then we're out by um, <laughs> nine-ish. And then there's the pub over the road, which is traditional. Okay, so that's, um, that's the general shape of things. Um, Matthew asked me to come this evening on the back of uh, a blog post I wrote. God, how long ago was that? About three months? Three three months ago. Ago. Yeah. Called um, something like Seven Ways to Improve Flow of software products or something like that. Who's, who's read that blog? Post? Maybe three or four. Okay. No worries. Uh, we're going to cover that. Um, but before I start talking about what might be regarded as the minutiae of flow and implementing flow in organizations, and I am going to come at this primarily from an organizational perspective. Um, again, we can segue into teams and um, individual products or projects, if that's of interest. But my kind of concerns these days are much more at the kind of organisational level. Um, so maybe I'll open up by open by talking about um, some responsibilities I had last year. Um, in fact, that post must be longer than that. No, yes, though there was a previous post to that um, around. In fact, it was entitled Product Development Flow, and I wrote that on the back of these responsibilities I had for a, a large international mm, professional services business. Um, when was that? That was beginning of 2013. And uh, for my sins, I... Actually, I appointed myself, or I gave myself my own title because somebody wanted to call me um, process manager or something like that, which was just not going to fly. <laughs> so uh, I ended up deciding to call myself uh, head of product development flow. And it was a global company in the sense that they had six different products, or rather six different customer-facing desktop products. Um, which all funneled um, traffic into their, their mainframe back end, which had been knocking around for donkey's years. Um, and these six different products were authored and maintained and evolved by six different groups in six different geographies around the world, uh, including Australia, America, Europe, and India. And the organization was in somewhat of a, a crisis with respect to its ability to get products out the door and into the market. Um, so it seemed to me that flow was an interesting idea, <laughs> not one that had uh, very deep roots in that organization, <coughs> but maybe one that could help them um, 
move a little bit closer to where they wanted to be. And where they wanted to be was they wanted to get these products into the market on a more regular basis, you know, releases, updates, uh, maybe um, re-implementations. Their flagship product had been in um, implementation for, or rather had been re-implementing it on a different platform uh, for like four or five years and they hadn't actually delivered anything, um, which is causing some <laughs> aggravation and concern at high levels, um, as it was their, as I said, their biggest product of their six in that, in that collection. Um, so really, I found there, and it's not the first time, and I'm sure it's not going to be the last time, that the real issue was people didn't know what Flow was, or why they wanted it, or what good it would be, or what they needed to do to go about getting it, or when they had it, what they could do with it in terms of taking each of the individual products and the whole pro portfolio forward. Um, I spent some months visiting various of, of these offices, uh, mainly in Europe, although I went to India as well, um, and tried to begin some conversations around uh, what flow was, um, what it meant, uh, what it might mean for them, uh, for their product, uh, and also for them personally, in, ter <coughs> excuse me, in terms of uh, maybe um, some entries on their CV to make them look more attractive when they wanted to find their next job or something like that. Um, <laughs> all rather much to no avail. There really wasn't very much interest in any kind of uptake. Um, and Flow was just kind of one, it was kind of like the poster child in that, in that context. Uh, but in terms of a broad range of opportunities for improvement, nobody was really particularly interested in, in improving every, anything. And that's really where I wanted to start today. Before I get on to the seven things you can do to improve flow, <laughs> kind of thing zero is just understand whether it's going to fly at all. Because in a lot of organizations, it's sufficiently a weird concept. It's sufficiently alien. It's sufficiently something that people have not heard about, or rather, Maybe they've vaguely heard about it, but not ever had the opportunity to think about it and think about what it meant to them, um, that it may never actually happen. It may never get off the ground. It may never get to the point <coughs> in people's consciousness where they begin to talk about it amongst themselves. I mean, it would be great, wouldn't it, if people said, hey, our software development, well, it's a bit lumpy at the moment. You know, we can... We, we shipped la the last re release kind of within uh, a couple of weeks of the deadline, but the, the release before that was about three months late, and the release before that was about six months late. And, and that doesn't mean we're getting better. <laughs> it's just kind of, we have a lot of variability in our ability to release on time, um, assuming there is some kind of release plan, which often doesn't really exist either. Uh, some organizations, perhaps, um, intelligently realize they're not in a position to ship reliably um, and then kind of just try just ship when they're ready. Um, I know Matthew's interested in tying this up with continuous delivery and configuration management and things like that and we can get there probably in the next half hour or so. Um, but just getting stuff into the market is really where I'm starting at. Um, so, any questions so far? With, uh, did you, were you able to get any traction or was this literally zero, it was never going to fly at this company? No. No, there was, there was no support from senior management, uh, there was no support from middle management, there was no support from product management, there was no support from people on the ground. <laughs> did you walk away at that point? Yes. Right, good. What's the basis, what's the basis on which you were engaged? <laughs> Um, to help them do stuff. 
<laughs> so they knew there was a problem, but they didn't, and they thought that you might be a solution, but they didn't like the idea. Um, or one person thought you were doing it. Someone knew that there was something you could do. Yes. Um, they had a new CTO who joined about a month or two before me, and he had known me for a long time. Or we had known each other for a long time. Or you could say that we were mates. Um, so he knew what I could do, and he knew that my skills kind of fitted their problem. Yet, <laughs> um, he hadn't been there long enough to understand um, the dynamics of the situation and the likelihood or otherwise of um, people in general wanting to see some kind of significant improvement. Um, as I said, this, this, this kind of flagship product was um, occupying everybody's minds to such an extent that uh, more str what you might regard as strategic considerations about the whole product portfolio and how they played with each other and maybe some kind of um, alignment or consolidation or harmonization of the different product lines because they were all serving essentially the same purpose, just to different markets in different geographies. Um, those kind of strategic considerations, which were in the back of my mind uh, as kind of future options, future possibilities, um, were never discussed because everybody was running around in little circles trying to get something out the door. <laughs> or fending off managers with the big sticks. Uh, if they were actually on the delivery side, saying, yes, well, we're trying our best, but, and this, and that, and... So, that was kind of the situation. So, uh, as I said, um, the post that we'll be discussing this evening or the points we'll be discussing this evening, are on my blog. You can find that on that there internet thing. Um, and these seven points are in no particular order, um, but I'll go with the order that they're listed in. And as I said, this is kind of looking at it from an organisational perspective. It's looking at it in improving flow. Um, who here would like me to di <coughs> excuse me, digress briefly and talk about the benefits of flow. Yeah? Okay. Um, so before we get to that then, um, well, we've already kind of um, talked around the subject of um, what we might can't regard as a regular cadence of putting new things into customers' hands. Um, some organisations look to release every three or six months or maybe a year um, when you move into the kind of agile space the aspiration is to be releasing every well if you're doing scrum on two week cycles then ideally you'd want to be releasing every two weeks um, I rarely see that happen in fact I saw a tweet today quoting Jeff Sutherland who said something like 80% um, of people doing a scrum never release anything at the end of a sprint. No, that wasn't quite right. Um, <laughs> people doing scrum um, rarely release things at the end of the sprint. Like 80% of the time they don't. 80% like of the time they get to the end of a sprint and don't release anything. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. And it's not just because they haven't finished <laughs> in that sprint. Uh, a lot of the time it's because their customers can't absorb that kind of um, release cadence. They can't take on um, a new release every two weeks. Uh, I was speaking to uh, one customer of a, of a software organization some time ago and they were saying, yeah, well, when we take this product, um, it takes us six months to pass it through our own internal acceptance testing. So if you give us something more frequently than six months, um, we're just going to throw it away because we, we, we're, we're still testing the previous one. <laughs> um, and in fact, we'd like you to give us something every two years because we don't really want to be continuously um, expending a lot of 
internal resources on testing every new release that comes through our door. And there's a lot of people do that. I mean, Microsoft, when they, um, with their Excel team, I think their Excel team got to a two, three, four weeks, something like that, um, release schedule, release cadence, and their customer base said, not the man in the street, but their corporate customer said, no way, stop. <laughs> I really don't want it this, this frequently. Um, you know, if there's a new feature that is kind of interesting, we can wait a month or two. It's really not a problem. <laughs> and we don't want to upgrade our 10,000 Excel uh, um, desktops every, uh, every two weeks. Thank you very much. Um, which you can understand. So back to the benefits of flow. Um, that's some of the downsides. Um, flow, for me, is about um, being able to predict, in a way, um, <coughs> when stuff is going to be ready. So that you can kind of synchronize all the things around each release, like documentation and service and support and help desks and pricing and marketing and uh, the whole nine yards. Who's here, who here has heard the term whole product? That's uh, a third. Okay, whole product um, comes from the more kind of, uh, I guess you call it the white goods end of the market. Um, or maybe cars are a good example. Um, in particular, Toyota. Um, Toyota can get a new car design from the drawing board, well, from conception, actually, into the market in about 15 months. And they do that um, by means of a thing called the Obeya, which is Japanese for the big room. And basically, they get all the specialists of all the aspects of the car, but not just the physical car, not just the engine and the seats and the cabin and the doors and the... Um, body shape and the suspension and the electronics and not just that but all the other things that go into making a car like the logistics the supply chain the factory that's going to make it or the production line in the factory that's going to make it the marketing materials the finance packages the uh, pricing schedules the sales and service the support all of that stuff is all put together in the obeya with uh, everybody else working with everybody else in the course of that 15 months. And the last figures I have on their competitors, people like GM and Ford, take, as I understand it, something like 24 to 36 months to, uh, to do the same kind of job. And I'm not so sure that they actually have a whole product concept either. Um, somebody could help me out with that, maybe, if you know about it. No, oh, that's something I should go away and look up later. Um, so flow is about getting stuff into the market, not so much on a regular cadence, but at least in a, in a kind of predictable way. So, and then synchronizing everything around that. And of course, the other alleged benefit of flow, and one, one day I'll see a software organization that actually has got a flow going, and then we'll be able to see whether it's true or not. <laughs> uh, but one of the alleged benefit, the other alleged benefit is it's, um, it's more effective, um, in terms of uh, less stress for the people working on it because things happen rather more um, calmly and smoothly uh, during the course of the um, product design and development. Uh, and, and consequently, perhaps, um, it's going to be cheaper as well. You're going to waste less time, less money, less effort than you would otherwise do. Okay, so... Point one on my list, and again, this is kind of looking at it from an organizational perspective, and I'll dip into that as we go along. Um, adopt a small thing as the universal unit of work. What universal unit of work do you use in your organizations? If you'd have to deliver a thing, what is that thing? that you work on and then deliver? Platform release. Platform release. So that's kind of like a big, lumpy, gooey gob of stuff. Yeah. And how often is that? 
Uh, I'm talking about a previous place I worked, but that was every six weeks. Okay, so not so huge, but it's probably like growing a little bit every six weeks and once you've done 10 or 20 of them, it's... We, we did start to shave it off, actually, so it didn't keep growing, but yes. Uh -huh. yeah. So that's platform release. Anybody else? Yeah, hotfix or a patch. Mm -hmm. Not so much a universal unit of work there. Right, no. But do you mean universal within an organisation? Yeah. Or no. No, within a particular organisation. Something that everybody from the technical teams through marketing and finance kind of recognises that that's, that's what they're shipping in one kind of unit. New versions of products, yeah. yeah. Um, MVP, not quite the right thing, because that's just probably once or twice at the early outset of a new idea. Well, it would just be some kind of a lump of functionality for a particular product set or particular type of product. And in our case, we have a cadence and we kind of have a roadmap and yeah. What's ready? Yeah, I've, I've kind of given you a bit of a clue earlier when I mentioned Scrum and Sprints. Um, some organisations, maybe not the whole organisation, maybe in the Scrum case, it's quite often limited to the technical teams or the technical department, but they ship sprint by sprint. So it'll be a, a sprint delivery or a sprint release. Story by story? Story by story, yeah. See, the ones we talked about, platform release or sprints, for me, they're a bit big. Uh, even a two-week sprint, you can get quite a lot of stuff done. And if you look at that as the unit of delivery, you already have a fairly large, chunky flow rather than something small that's being delivered more frequently or potentially more frequently. Um, so user stories... Um, and who, who here uses user stories in their uh, delivery or development teams? Okay, so that's half of you. Um, and typically, how much effort goes into a, a, a particular user story? How big is a user story? Don't tell me story points, please. <laughs> we, we try to define them as a less than a day, which means potentially from the moment that we come in in the morning and there's a designer and developer working on them, we could release by 5 of Chrome. Mm -hmm. Does that include the conversations that you're going to have around that user story with the people? There who is usually a bit of conversation before, but they are vague or they're just concepts that we discuss. Uh -huh. So like two or three people for a day? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's close to my, my mental model is sort of two or three people for two or three days. Um, Whatever works for you. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it's... If your organisation, and as I said, not just your technical group or technical team, if your organisation understands that that's what the unit of delivery is in that company, then things can start happening. You may not get there in terms of being able to produce one and ship it, and another one and ship it, you may still have to do it in slightly larger groups, clumps, batches. We've got the concept of a feature flag, basically, which means we are happy to release certain parts of working functionality towards staging smoke environments, and then it goes directly to production as well, mm -hmm. but it's behind the feature flag. So yeah. It's not seen to the end user too, it's really ready. So sometimes it is one day of work and it goes, sometimes it's longer period of time. Mm. So a feature flag is something that can turn, yeah, turn on well. or off a user story in production. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of the first way. Yeah, change. That's the first change. If you're thinking about improving flow in your organisation, who, who here is thinking about improving flow in their organisation? Yeah. <laughs> Who here thinks that that's, that's onto a winner? You're onto a winner there. You think it's likely to fly. Yeah, a lot, lot fewer hands, yeah. 
It's, it's, as I said at the outset, you know, it's, it's kind of a big thing. Um, you may not think of it as a big thing. It's not like a kind of root and branch restructuring of the organization. It's not like turning the organization from a command and control hierarchy into a flat value stream um, sociocracy or something. <laughs> That's a major change. I mean, that's huge. I mean, that, that's, everything would have to change in that kind of context. Uh, and you'd be um, reasonable to respect, expect that that's going to be tricky. <laughs> but just introducing the concept of flow, uh, before you actually even do anything to improve flow, just getting people to buy into that idea, I can see some people understand that even that is a little bit leading edge maybe bleeding edge. So for those people who are considering that, good on you. <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, my blog post started out by saying um, a lot of people when they consider lean and some of the lean principles and try and think about how that might apply or you might be able to repurpose some of those principles from manufacturing or lean service into software development. Um, a lot of people kind of get hung up on the idea that waste is what, what lean talks about and getting rid of the seven wastes or the eight wastes or the ten wastes, depending on which list you're looking at. Um, for me, waste, re waste elimination or waste reduction is kind of like a byproduct of flow. If you have better flow in an organization, even within one team, if you have better flow within one team, you will start to see the wastes better and you will start to um, be able to work on them and, and, and maybe remove some of them or reduce some of them. Who here has heard the Toyota story about the, the analogy of uh, flow as rocks in a river? One, two, yeah. Okay, I'll give you that again, maybe just quick, briefly so you can go and look it up yourself. Um, but f Toyota make this analogy um, of improving flow, and they're talking about manufacturing lines, so it's not quite the same thing. Um, but they say, we reduce whip working process so that it's like you've got a river and it's wide and broad and deep and there's lots and lots of inventory in the system. That's kind of like the starting state. And what we do, they say, although frankly they were doing it 40 years ago, so they probably got a lot, a long way down that path, is we take the whip, we reduce the whip, the working process. We reduce the inventory on the factory floor. It's like reducing the level of the river to the point where some of the big rocks begin to poke up through the surface. And those rocks are the waste. They're what's impeding the flow of the river. And by taking inventory out of the system, some machines on the production line start stalling because they haven't got the thing that they need to process next, the next component that they're going to heat treat or mill or polish or whatever it is, paint, is <coughs> not there. So the operator goes, where's it gone? And by creating those kind of artificial, in a way, um, problems, they begin to see with more clarity, they're making visible some of the wastes in the system. But they're doing that through a reducing, the, reducing the working process, the reducing the inventory. Um, and that's kind of like analogous to the flow metaphor that I'm using this evening. Um, so the last thing I'm going to say about that first point is, who's heard of the Japanese term haijunka? Anybody here? Haijunka. Okay, haijunka is another term from Japanese manufacturing. It's about balancing the flow of components through the factory. So if, if your factory, if your production line is making big things, medium-sized things, and small things, um, maybe big fridges, medium-sized fridges, and small fridges, then the standard mindset for a long time was, well, let's make 100 big fridges, and then we'll change over the production line and make 100 medium-sized fridges, 
and then change over the production line and make 200 small fridges because there's more demand for them, so we're going to make more of them. So that we minimise our changeovers right, on all the tooling and all the machines and all the operators and everything don't have to change over so much. So we're not wasting so much time. What Hijunka says is, actually, we want to balance the thing. So we'll make a big fridge, and then we'll make a medium fridge, and then we'll make a small fridge, and then we'll go make back and make a big fridge again. So we're constantly changing over the tooling. We're constantly changing over the parts that are being selected to, for assembly. And that kind of balancing drives out, again, in the same way that um, reducing inventory can um, show up some problems. That kind of balancing helps show up some problems as well. And you can drive out other aspects of waste in the system by forcing yourself or forcing your production line to change over its manufacturing item each every time. Um, Toyota have a thing which they're quite famous for. It's called single minute exchange of dye, SMED. Has anybody heard of SMED? Would you like to tell us about it? <laughs> basically reduce the time that it takes to move from being able to build one configuration to the next. Yeah. The die we're talking about is kind of like a big 10 ton piece of steel which stamps out a, a, a car panel, like a front wing or a roof or something. Um, and I forget where they started, but they, I think it was 20 hours or something like that. It took them 20 hours to change this die out for a different one, for a different make of, make of car, well, different, different um, configuration of car, so it might be an estate as opposed to a saloon, and some of the panels might be different. So they were, they were taking, well, anyway, a long time, but, and we talk about 20 or 30 years ago now, probably longer than that. But somebody said, I forget who it was, it probably was a Toyota or Ono, said, look, let's pitch for being able to change these dies in one minute. <laughs> Single minute exchange of dye, SMED. And it took them years and years and years and years. And actually, I don't even know whether they've got to uh, one minute exchange even now. But they brought it down from dozens of hours down to a few minutes. With High Junker in mind, being able to change over their production line for each different variant each time. So that's another aspect of picking a small thing. Because if you pick a small thing, particularly in software development, you're not going to be stuck on working on it from weeks or months on end. Who here has had the component from hell or the subsystem from hell that's just taken months of, <laughs> of people working on it and it never seems to be finished? Yes. <laughs> Was that a big thing? Or was it just a small thing that was just very tricky? Big thing. It was a big thing, yeah. So the first point is about making things smaller. And that, again, don't do it overnight. Don't think you have to do it overnight. Don't go from like a three-month big thing, three-month of effort big thing, um, to uh, two or three people for two or three days kind of small thing. Don't do that overnight. You don't, well, you don't have to do it overnight. If you can do it overnight, then great, but... <laughs> seems unlikely, but just think about Toyota, think about SMED, think about how long it took them to go from many hours to a few minutes in, in terms of their size of thing. How important is the universal factor there? Because within and across all the software development teams, we didn't get universal across that layer. But as soon as you step that out you know, into a different part of the organization like sales or marketing, it's much harder potentially to be able to be, have a universal unit of work that they recognize particularly if you're an organization that's selling to different markets. So if you've got something like a small uh, you know, uh, point tool, you can release, you know, check for updates on that very, very regularly. And then if they're in the, the same organization, you've got something that's really selling into enterprise where they don't want to change at a high rate. Suddenly that, 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 quick, that small unit of work doesn't, well, doesn't apply, but they can't ship it at the same rate that you're delivering it. Yes. So how, how, how do you reconcile the idea of it being universal unit of work if the different endpoints in the organization are treated differently? Um, or different requirements are there? 
my suggestion that it becomes a universal understanding across the whole organization is m more from the point of view of introducing the concept of flow. It's not so much about what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis practically. It's about how can we begin to have conversations across the whole organization about flow and what, it, what implications they have. Because let's face it, most of our organizations do not have obeyers. They do not have big rooms. They do not have whole product development. Um, they have, particularly if software is involved in any kind of key way, they have the technical team who's producing the software. And then one day, I'll set aside that whole question of continuous uh, integration and continuous deployment for a second. Um, but most of the time, they'll come up with a release. And that may be a release on schedule, or it may be just a release when it happens. But they'll say to the rest of the organization, all right, here it is. It's wonderful. Play with it. Use it. Sell it to your customers. Sell it to our customers. And then everybody goes, yeah, well, OK, what do we do with it now? <laughs> I've got to write marketing materials. I've got to plan marketing campaigns if it's a, a public product. Um, I've got to talk to our customers if it's a more of a private thing, or I've got to, if it's an internal product in a bigger business. You know, I've got to go out and talk to the users and tell them it's it's ready and how to. And then we've got to do some training, and, and the help desk has got to be able to take calls about the new features. And so the the, the organisation kind of runs, scurries round on the stimulus of here it is, or maybe here it's going to be next week. A <laughs> um, little bit of advance notice would be nice. Um, and everything kind of goes into firefighting mode, and everybody runs around and goes, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> I wish they'd told us earlier. Um, maybe there was some kind of plan or roadmap. Maybe some people even read it. <laughs> but I suspect that in most organizations, not much happens until it's pretty close to release. And then all hell breaks loose in a different kind of hell way. <laughs> um, so again, if you have conversations around how you're going to release things, how you're going to deliver things, and the unit of the release or the unit of delivery, then you can begin to have conversations about flow. Because people say, well, why are you doing that? And you can say, well. <coughs> we thought that maybe we could get a little bit more predictable about or reduce cost or whoever you're talking to and whatever their agenda is um, by making the units of delivery smaller and more flexible. We can swap things in and swap things out. You know, if there's a demand in the market for a particular feature suddenly, we can rearrange our schedule and get that into the pipeline for shipping, or delivery, or distribution, or whatever it is. Um, so it's, this is more about having that kind of conversation and introducing people to the concept of flow. How many people here work with organizations where flow is a um, concept in general use? One, two, three, four, three and a half. <laughs> Out of 30? So. Yeah, it's, it's even now, it's not very common for people to understand what it actually, even you know, in, in the broadest terms, what it means. Okay, so point two, it's a kind of simpler point. Make flow visible, make it visible. Now, anybody here using Kanban? Uh, yeah, half a dozen, a little bit more. Um, I like personal Kanban. If I'm in a situation where um, I've got a thousand and one things coming at me from 26 different directions, <laughs> I have been there, um, and I need to keep on top of it and prioritize what I'm doing and make sure everything kind of more or less gets done, I'll make sure I limit my own whip and I'll make things visible and I'll use personal Kanban to do that. Anybody here use personal Kanban? Uh, three, four. <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, and I, I'm very much um, impressed with what Jim's managed to do. Jim Benson, inventor of personal Kanban, I'm, with what he's ma managed to do with the whole personal Kanban thing. But personal Kanban has two rules. Anybody want to suggest what those two rules are? It's a 
I've already given you a clue. Limit work in progress. Limit work in progress. Make it visible. And make it make things visible. Yeah. And that's it. Just two things in personal campaign. And so this is about making flow visible. If you've got a Kanban or any other kind of wall, sticky wall, card wall, you can start keeping track of things like how long has it been on the wall? How many times has it gone back a stage? Um, I know people who get a little rubber date stamp and stamp the card or put a little coloured spot on it every day to correspond to which column it's been in. Lots of different ways of um, marking up the cards so that you can begin to see visually and I'm not talking about mad metrics programs where you measure a thousand and one different things just just get some way of giving you an indication of are our user stories if that's your small unit are they flowing generally regularly across the work board from beginning to done or delivered or whatever your last column is <coughs> And on an organisational level, again, try and make, extend that um, information radiator, or maybe, maybe set of information radiators, upstream, because a lot of the flow problems come upstream where people haven't actually decided what they want yet. It might be the product owner, it might even be before the product owner, the people he's talking to. Um, so there will be nominally cards, they may not actually be on a physical cards, they may not be on a wall somewhere, but there, there will be things that are often stalled in queues, hanging around for um, six months. Don Reinerson calls that the fuzzy front end. And uh, that can be a, a source of great lack of flow in product development. And then downstream, when it's passed out of the technical teams or development teams remit, Sometimes, if you've got DevOps, that, that, that wall or that flow may actually ex extend into production. But then there's things beyond that as well. So again, make the whole flow visible. Um, know your WIP. Who here works with WIP limits? Two, three, four, five, okay. So we've, we've talked about limiting work in process or work in progress. Um, and making that visible as well. But Kanban, some Kanban teams, some Kanban implementations actually have uh, limits on the number of cards that they can have in each column. And you can't start working on a new thing until you've got rid of an old thing. Uh, who's heard of Little's Law? Again, two or three people. Um, on account of the time, I'm not going to go into that today, but I just, uh, if you're interested in um, queuing theory and how arrival rates and process rates and work in process limits um, improve, help, help to improve flow, then little law, Little's Law is something that's mentioned very often in the Kanban community particularly. Um, who here uses a pool system? That is um, you look at what somebody needs and then you produce to that demand. Yeah. Um, in software it's, it's a little bit less clear cut than in manufacturing. Manufacturing somebody wants a, a new car, the um, ideal pull system for manufacturing a car would be somebody goes into a showroom or the factory and says I want a car and then they push a button virtually, um, <laughs> and that demand for a car goes all the way back up the production line. It says, give me a car, and then there'll be a nearly finished car that is, um, that then pulls some components, that then pulls some assembly, that then pulls some manufacturing, that then pulls maybe some external suppliers all the way back up to, eventually you get back to the individual raw materials. And if you can arrange a pool system that goes all the way like back that way, um, that's, uh, that's an ideal pool system in a way. Um, push, on the other hand, is manufacturing for um, like inventory. You've got a big warehouse out the back. The 
production lines keep churning over 24 hours a day or eight hours a day or whatever the production schedule says and your warehouse fills up when people aren't buying and then it kind of empties a little bit when people are buying and that's kind of like a push system you just make stuff on the basis that you hope people are going to buy it in software the same kind of principles generally apply although it's, as I said it's kind of slightly different um, if you're in a pool system you'll only start writing a piece of software or putting it together maybe you've maybe got pre pre um, created components or something that make it quicker for you to put that final thing together but you'll only put it together and deliver it when somebody asks for it um, as opposed to a push system is you'll be writing software and writing software and pushing it out there and seeing if anybody wants it like features particularly or user stories you, know, you say we think somebody's going to want this user story we're going to build it <laughs> we're going to put it out there into the into the product we're going to see if anybody uses it um, that in itself seems to be a little bit more wasteful and less flow oriented than, than the pull strategy except for Apple um, maybe. maybe yes um, yeah it's, it's difficult to extrapolate to some kind of mass market consumer good <laughs> uh, you could imagine that Apple could orient their, orient their production lines around a, a pool system and that every time anybody wanted an iPhone they'd go and make it for them um, I mean Toyota do that for cars in, in Japan you ask for a car and seven days later they've made it for you and delivered it to you but they don't have it sitting on a parking lot somewhere <laughs> they actually don't start making it the, until they actually get the order for it then they can put the whole thing together in seven days probably not yes well it's the American way still making lots of cars and hoping and then you have to discount stuff and you make them in the wrong colors or you have to like make them cheaper and so you get left over the, this year's model because everybody was waiting for the next year's model, so you have to discount it again just to shift them. And, and that's kind of like how the American car manufacturing um, industry has produced cars for, since they started, really. Um, and, of course, Toyota is not universally making cars to order. That's only, as far as I understand, in Japan. You know, in, uh, in Europe, it's a different model. They, they have factories in Europe, but they don't make, them, make cars to order. At least not to my knowledge, if anybody wants to correct me on that one. Um, so the next point I'm getting to is point five, so we're almost there, is handoffs. Eliminate or reduce handoffs. Um, who's had any connection with the business process re-engineering? Fad, you could call it? Uh, or fashion or trend of about, when was that, 10 or 15 years ago? Um, and one of the kind of cornerstones of business process re-engineering, which was about re-engineering your business processes to take waste out, um, was eliminating handoffs. That was kind of one of their key strategies. Handoff is when you do a little bit of work, but you can't finish whatever it is, uh, when we talk about user stories. Um, you do a little bit of work on the user story, but you can't finish it, so you've got to hand it off to somebody. And then they take it, but they're not going to work on it straight away. They can, it's going to sit around for like half an hour, or a day, or a week, or a month, until they get round to it, because they're going to have a queue of stuff waiting for them. Um, so when they get round to it, they'll do their little bit of work. Maybe they have to hand it off to a third person, and then they'll do their little bit of work. But again, you know, there's a, a delay involved there. Um, and even if you have multi-skilled people in the development team so that one person has all the skills that's necessary to make that thing from beginning to end, take the user story, card, have the conversation with whoever's the representative of the 
requirements or hypotheses upon which that story is based begin to create the, the, the implementation for that user story. Um, maybe even you've got testers in the team um, or people with skills. Um, but in most cases, testing is a handoff. Um, so there's a the delay there. I mean, we all, we've all seen the, the, the organization I was with um, talking about earlier. Um, they had a two-month delay in their testing. Like when you handed something over to testing, it would be about two months before they could tell you whether it was any good or not. Um, the major bottleneck in continuous delivery. Sorry? It's a major bottleneck in, in, in continue, what they call continuous delivery, which you said you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, the whole industry is talking about C, CD being bottlenecked by testing. Yeah. And, and it's not actually dependent on flood. It's just the fact that it takes time. Um, and I wrote another series of blog posts and uh, created a hashtag recently on Twitter called No Testing. <laughs> Which doesn't mean no testing absolutely. It doesn't mean just create the piece of software like you always do and then just throw it at the customer. That's not what it means. <laughs> it means create a piece of software in a way that doesn't need that testing step but doesn't need that queue, that delay. And there are a number of different strategies you can apply. Um, I was at Agile Testing Days recently. There are some people that are doing testing up front. There are some people that have testers on the team, so they're very much more integrated, and the delay is much reduced, not perhaps obviated entirely. So there are different strategies that you can use, again, for improving flow. And it's, at this point, five is about reducing handoffs. Uh, and ideally eliminating them on the kind of core strategy and I wrote a blog post about this last week um, the core strategy for reducing handoffs is having more skills in any individual multi-skilled individuals so, or if that's problematic then multi-skilled teams so that you don't have to wait for a specialist you don't have to wait people can maybe they're not as good Say, you, say you've got like a front end and a back end and the front end's in uh, HTML and JavaScript and the back end's in Java. Okay, there are people still doing that. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things that we began to do uh, when I was uh, at News International was um, there was a clear demarcation when I arrived between front-end developers, back-end developers, and testers. And although they talked to each other, the process really wasn't kind of geared around minimizing the handoffs and delays, because there were these three completely different constituencies and completely different skills and completely different people. So that was not suiting them, the technical people. Um, they weren't really happy being pigeonholed in such narrow specialisms. They appreciated the opportunity to begin to learn each other's um, work. Now, obviously, if somebody's been doing JavaScript for five years, then they're going to be a little bit better at it than uh, maybe a back-end developer who has been doing Java for five years but has only just seen JavaScript um, occasionally. But it's... a uh, conscious decision to allow people or even encourage people, support people, to acquire those new skills and to begin to use them. Because until you use them on a job, obviously they're not actually going to get much better. They're not going to improve. Point six. Identify the goal. Um, my late colleague Grant Rule who used to speak for Proms G here quite regularly. Um, he made a point of wherever he went, whichever audience he went and spoke to in companies or publicly, he'd ask them, how many of you understand the goal of your organization? And he'd always get more or less 8 to 10% of the audience saying that they felt they understood the goal of the organization. That's there are more than 90% who didn't understand the goal of the organization. A flow is about improving your delivery 
with respect to the goal. Um, and if you don't know what the goal is, then you can't really take very many intelligent steps to improve your flow. What's going on there? Uh, who here uses theory of constraints in their organizations, teams? One, two, two and a half. <laughs> okay, theory of constraints is a whole body of work by Eli Yahoo Goldratt, who again started out in manufacturing. He wrote the book called The Goal, ironically, we just talk about goals. Um, and who's read The Goal? That's more of you, okay. Um, maybe half. And the goal is a book about improving flow in manufacturing, basically. Um, you, could, you could characterize it in other terms, but uh, I see it in that light. Um, improving the throughput of a factory by, I don't know, by the, end of time, but by the end of the book, an order of magnitude, something like that. They were making 10 times more stuff using the same people and the same machines and the same factory, basically. Something like that. Um, and he's written a whole series of books and then he's kind of repurposed the, the manufacturing principles of theory of constraints uh, to service industries. There's one book about retail and there's one about software, corporate software development. Um, and there's a whole bunch of uh, ideas, tools, techniques, diagram types, um, analysis tools for looking at where you are now, where you want to be, and what's impacting your flow. What's preventing, again, from an organization-wide perspective, what's preventing the organization doing more, making more, shipping more, billing more at the moment. And it gives you tools for spotting the constraint. That's what's called theory of constraints, the bottleneck and then gives you options for doing things about it. And then finally, point seven, and we're just on time, um, experiment. This is the basis of the Toyota Way, or well, at least a basis of the Toyota Way. Um, who, anybody here use A3s in their work? One, one or two? Talk to that man afterwards about A3s. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but in more general terms, uh, okay, we've heard about Lean Startup and how Lean Startup says having a hypothesis about who's going to buy your thing and um, then go out and try that hypothesis, perform some experiments, see whether your hypothesis actually proves to be true or false. Uh, and if it's true, you might have a market, you might have a product, and if it's false, then you can go back to step, step one and <coughs> try a different hypothesis. Um, And in this context, uh, who's heard of the term PDCA? Plan, do, check, act. Or the Schuett cycle, sometimes called the Deming cycle. And it's not the only um, PDCA is plan what you're going to do. Uh, plan your experiment, basically. Form a hypothesis and plan your experiment. Do, do some stuff. Perform the experiment according to the plan. Check, check the results, compare them against what you expected. Does that prove or disprove your hypothesis? And then act. It's kind of like the basic, basis of the scientific method as it goes all the way back to Francis Bacon. Um, act, depending on what the check tells you. Are you. Is your hypothesis proven? In which case you can like refine it or move on to something else, um, exploit it. Um, or it's disproven, in which case you have to formulate a new hypothesis, go through the plan, do, check, loop, act, loop again. Um, it's not the only loop of that kind. You may have heard of Boyd's observe, orient, decide, act, um, which is, um, comes from uh, fighter, fighter jets, um, air combat. He was an uh, air combat strategist and pilot. 
and he came up with the OODA loop. Um, there's also lambda. Where does lambda come from? Is that Alan Ward? Look, ask, model, decide, act. Um, they're all kind of variations on the same theme, which is about experimentation. Um, and in fact, I like the idea that um, requirements are not requirements. Uh, they're actually hypotheses. They're actually hypothesizing about what somebody wants or needs. And until you've actually tested that hypothesis, it's probably not a good idea to get, spend a lot of time building something finished. Uh, just maybe to prove the hypothesis, you need to build something small. Maybe that might be a paper model or a prototype or something like that. But uh, it's in the context of experimentation. That's my seven points. Seven changes that you can make. Um, and then, so just to wrap up. It's been my experience that the real problem is not, or the real challenge is not um, doing these seven things. The real challenge is actually getting people engaged in the, in the concept of flow. And until you've got people in various parts of the organization, certainly in various parts of the development organization, who begin to think, oh, well, maybe. Maybe I want to improve. I mean, that's the first hurdle. Lots of organizations, people just not interested in improvement of any kind. But uh, when they get to the point where maybe I want to improve, maybe that would be interesting. Maybe we can do that together. Maybe that would be something that we can do as a team. Um, and then, oh, but maybe flow is something to look at. Maybe that's one avenue, one area that we can pursue. Maybe we can look at what's blocking our flow at the moment. Of course, the term blockers is quite um, common in Scrum. Is it, is it a Kanban term as well? Those Kanbaners here, do you have blockers on your board? Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's look at what's blocking our flow, and then we can, like, maybe we can improve by... Um, improving our flow. Maybe that's one avenue of making things better. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.